feel like I've been away for so long. It's been a whole week. Um, we were away at Sheffield last week and we had a fantastic time uh, speaking at Sparview. Uh, it was really good to be with those guys that, that share heart with us, one of the ground level churches, uh, part of the network that we belong to. So um, we loved being with them, but we love being back, Joel, don't we? It's great to be back in family. Um, I'm going to continue this morning in part of the series I've been doing, so uh, hopefully you'll be with me in this. Uh, you know, we really want to connect with God this morning. Uh, we're not here just to fill time. We're not here being religious. We're not just rocking up and doing church. We want to do business with God, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Last time uh, when I introduced this new series, um, this Promise series, uh, based mainly in Matthew, it's something we're doing alongside this in, in Connect Groups as well. Um, one of the questions we asked is, uh, how should we see Jesus? You know, and we decided he was our foundation, our cornerstone, our stability in a very unstable world, uh, which in the last two weeks, since it was last year, is more unstable than it was then. Uh, we decided he was our king. It would give, we would give our, to him our faith, our loyalty, our allegiance for life and living. Um, we would give him our kingdom come lifestyle. This week, we're going to ask the question, how do we become like him? That's a big, isn't it? How do we become like Jesus. Um, and actually, the answer is simple. We turn our allegiance and commitment away from sin and give our allegiance and commitment and way of life to Jesus. It's that simple. Amen. Let's do a coffee. It is that simple to put into words. It's a whole lot different trying to live it. It's a whole lot different trying to be it, and we all battle and we wrestle. And actually, what's been great this morning through the worship time, it's been really interesting, just as an aside, to see these amazing declarations of, he's God, and I'm all yours, and Jesus, you're amazing, and I'm so broken. And Lord, I need you. And you know, there's no contradiction there at all. There's a really beautiful symmetry going off there, that at the very moment you can feel Christian broken, you can also declare the praises of our God. In fact, actually, when you feel Christian broken, that is not the time to hide away, to lock your front door, to stay away and say, oh, I'm, too, I'm too low, I'm too low to connect with church, I'm too low to connect with God. No, that's the very moment you need to connect with God. Never hide behind your front door. Always be there. We are, there's always a welcome in God's household. And we are part of, we discovered this when I spoke, we are part of God's household, so we are always going to be welcome. It is the place where we get to connect with God in our worship. Um, there seem to be some unwritten rules in life about how things are meant to be, just how it is. Um, you know, like we just queue, on auto, but we just queue. You see a queue, you join it. Uh, you, it's, it's a thing that we do. There are certain things that we do, and if you step outside of those normal things, we all get very uppity. Um, I can walk around Morrison's, and as I walk around Morrison's, um, this week I went, and I'm thinking, you've got to wear a mask till next Thursday. Oh. And I get I'm real wound up about those things, and, 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 and the other thing I get annoyed about are people that break the rules at, at pedestrian crossings, when I can see the car just rolling forward a little bit, and I think, I'm still crossing, and it's still green. You're breaking the rules. I get really wound up about, there are things you're supposed to do, and I get really legalistic, But sometimes there's those moments when people step outside normal and then there's trouble, there's radical, there's rebel and there's wrong. And we don't really like rebel, radical and wrong. And yet it has an appeal to us, doesn't it? Anybody here enjoy being a rebel? I do, as long as it's safe. <laughs> safe rebellion. Today more than ever people appear to try to live, it seems to me... Loads of people are trying to live outside the normal today. We're in a world where people want to live outside of the normal. And we all kind of want to follow the rules and we want to be obedient, and yet people are trying to live outside of the normal. People want to be rebellious and do their own thing. Um, even the great and powerful want to keep everything as it is but live outside of the parameters. Um, all the stereotypes of misfits seem to have become normal these days. And, and, and look, I, I'm not casting judgment. I'm simply saying that in my lifetime, I've seen a massive shift in morality. I've seen a massive shift in, in how things appear, how people physically look. I've seen a massive shift in sexuality, uh, in progressive thinking. Been a massive shift recently in the whole concept of this thing called woke culture and even cancel culture. 
everything anyone wants to do or to be must be right for them if it feels good. Is the, is the world that I find myself living in now. Except when I look through history, that has been the conversation and the, distro- the, the discovery of every generation. I can go right back for 4,000 years and people saying exactly the same things as that. The world seems to have lost shape. No, like the world has always been human shaped. The world has always looked like people. It has always been full of these things. It is no different now to the 1970s. It's no different um, than it was in the 1960s. We just have different technology. I mean, for goodness sake, we had carry-on films and you think it's bad now. <laughs> they would not... Be, they are not woke. They are... <laughs> but every generation thinks it is the generation that has lost control, where everything has changed. No, actually, what it is, people are always in rebellion. People are always trying to work it out to live. And, you know, people don't always choose rebellion. They're just trying to work it out to live without parameters and without guidelines without understanding what they're called to be. And we know that we're called to be like Christ. That is what we're designed for. Everybody wants to do or to be something that feels right for them. I quite like it, actually. I actually quite enjoy it because it gives you such a rich tapestry. But you know it's all been done before. It's all old. It's all been discovered. Nothing's for the first time. I just love... I, love, I, I, was, I went to Costa the other day and a couple of young girls walked in. One had a Black Sabbath T-shirt on, and the other had an ACDC T-shirt on, and they were both rebels for a cause. And I'm thinking, you weren't even born. (laughs) You weren't born when most of the band had died, let alone when they were releasing music. There there was a time when I wanted wanted to change everything to live radical, Uh, but I just didn't, I couldn't be bothered. Um... (laughs) Story of my life. My son takes after me in a similar kind of way. Hey, let's rebel next week. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just safer, Rob, isn't it? Just play it safe. Just like sensibly press through. It works. Uh, I, I, I'm going to tell you a running story. I decided that I would run. I would be a runner. I, so I signed up for a marathon because that was a radical thing to do, a London marathon. And I knew I could do it because I bought some supplements. And if I took the supplements, I'd be all right. And I went, so I discovered that the supplements made no difference whatsoever. Um, so I thought, right, if the supplements are not making me a good runner, I'll just cut a load of stuff out. So I'll cut chocolate and alcohol out. And, and you know what? That didn't really make a great deal of difference. What made a difference was changing my entire lifestyle, was changing who I was and living differently. That made a difference. I've got to rediscover that truth um, <laughs> in the next two months before Manchester Marathon. <laughs> We all do it in some way. We think if I can just add this or just take this away, everything would just be right. No, actually, we've got to live differently. When we become Christians, we are new creations. We're not added to or taken away a bit. We are new. If I only had that thing, who has said this? If I only had that thing in my life, my life would be complete. I'm, I'm, that's me. If I just had that thing, it's only, not big things. If I just had that, my life would be complete. Hence, Julie has to live with a clutter around my house. I collect things. If I, if I only stop that one thing, my life will be great. If I only had that ringtone on my phone, <laughs> my life would be complete. For everybody that's watching this at home, the entire congregation now has turned around to Eliza at the back to stare at her because the phone rang. If only is one of the most tragic, in denial things we can ever say. When we think, if only I had, if only I didn't, if only I could, if only they would, if only. If only we could stop thinking that way. The challenge for followers of Jesus is just how opposite and counterculture we are called to be. We're not called to blend in. We're actually called to stand out. Our radical and revolu- we're meant to be radical and revolutionary. It's the call of discipleship. You know, we see Jesus, though. As Christians, we see Jesus in one of three ways. Number one, I want Jesus to add something to my life. Is something we do. Number two, I want Jesus to affirm my way of life. Is a big one. Number three, I want Jesus to lead my whole life. Yeah. Is the correct one and the hard one. Each can be good and you can find salvation in each place. But only one is radical faith and allegiance to Christ. Only one is saying, Lord, you are my, you're my, you're my God, you're my king. Yeah. Two, seek to supplement or excuse our lifestyle. Um, just, just, I just want to warn you, some of this might get uncomfortable this morning. Is that all right? 
Check it up with God, because it's all using Bible verses. Okay? I am only quoting the Bible at you this morning. Do not get stroppy with me. This is, d- 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 take it to God. One will transform our lives. And, and I know this sounds dramatic. I know when I start saying, you know, this is big and this is uncomfortable, but it sounds a bit dramatic. But hey, I want you to think on this. This is about our eternal salvation. Yeah. Of course it's big and dramatic. This is like cosmic and eternal. This is the, this is the eternal future for all mankind. The whole humanity. So, yeah, it should be different. So I can't just take a bit off or add a bit on. In the 1939 movie, anybody seen The Wizard of Oz? Dorothy says to her dog, (laughs) what? You love it. The Wizard of Oz. Weird film. Drug trip. Dorothy says to her dog at one point, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. It's a phrase that, that we often use. It's a phrase I use occasionally now as well. It's a phrase that's come to mean that we've stepped outside of what is considered normal. We have entered a place of circumstance that is unfamiliar and uncomfortable. We've found ourselves in a strange situation. We're outside of normal. It's become unfamiliar. It's become uncomfortable. Life has become strange. Hope House Church, I want to tell you, when we become Christians, when we live as church like this, we're not in Kansas anymore. It's not the nice black and white, safe place. So what transforms and brings abundant life and call and purpose and fulfillment? Faith in Christ. Giving our lives exclusively. Giving our allegiance to him before anything and everyone else. Our loyalty being given to him and nothing else. That one is truly faith living. And remember, faith, the Greek word pistis, means he's reliable. It means we, are, we have a fidelity to him. We've made a commitment. We've given our loyalty to him. We are living in allegiance to him. You know, faith sometimes means faith for receive. Oh, I have faith to receive. I have faith to get. Actually, the concept of faith, first of all, is not in the thing, not in the having, but in Jesus. Saying, you are first. My loyalty is to you before anything and everybody else. We're about to do a wedding in a couple of weeks' time. And a couple are going to say they're going to commit their first love, their first loyalty. They're actually going to say in their vows, my first loyalty and commitment is to you after God. Because first it is God. The question is not, do you have faith and passion? The question is, what are you passionate about? We all have passions. Anybody here think they're not passionate? Oh, I've got to tell you, somebody just put their hand up over here, get a grape. You are, you know, you do, no, you only do passion. <laughs> We're all passionate about something. We all commit to something. The things of God are the things of this world. God designed us for worship. So the question really is, what do we worship? Because we worship something. So let's look at what radical lifestyle will look like because I want us to understand what it is to be blessed this morning and to walk in that lifestyle so we begin to look like Jesus, how we become like him. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 to 12, there's some really familiar verses. And they should be the most challenging verses we ever read because it tips on, on its head the language that we like to use. Starting in verse 3, it's, it's, it's Jesus goes up onto a mountain, and actually he's teaching his disciples, but a whole bunch of people come and watch, like thousands of them come to listen in uh, to what Jesus is teaching. And he says this, begins in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. I'm not going to say blessed. I've got suddenly all King James on you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Wow! Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, they persecute you. These chapters are more than wishful thinking. They're a level of lifestyle that is just out of this world. And here's the radical thing. Did you notice what blessed didn't say there? 
Let's change our language. You know what? I am blessed to be on holiday. I am blessed to have a new car. I am blessed to be having a meal out. I am blessed to have bought some new clothes. No, they're just things. None of the blessed things in there are about any of those things. Every, every blessing comes from our attitude before God. What is my relationship with Jesus? How am I living for Jesus? That's where blessing is found. In my attitude and conduct, in who I am before God, that is a place of, of blessing. Everything else is a place of privilege and gift. And I know that's uncomfortable. By the way, none of, none, of, none of those other things I've just mentioned are wrong. But let's not call them blessings. Blessing is being like Christ and inheriting what Christ has for us. They're a picture and explanation, actually, of Jesus' own life lived amongst us. When you read the Beatitudes, you read them. Just read them and think, that is the heart of Christ. That is how Jesus lived. You know, he said the fruit of the Spirit describe his character. Well, the Beatitudes describe his lifestyle. That is a lifestyle of Jesus. So we have this full picture of the character and lifestyle that brings in Jesus. And we are called to live the same way. Surrendering Jesus, surrendering his place with God to live with us. Persecuted for his radical living and yet alive and restored in power as the Son of God, our King in his kingdom. And we are blessed if we live like him. And so I want to live like him. And I know that's, that's a little, wow, this is too big for me to grapple with because I'm a, just a normal person. I get things wrong. Yeah, you do. But there are moments every day where you can get it right. It might be for a moment. But that moment you get it right, you can be blessed and be like Christ and then be a blessing to others. They're the first way that we can discover the character of Christ within us, the living of Christ within us. So we can literally go through that list and say, how can I embody that? How can I live that? How can I do that? They explain how we're able to stand with King Jesus and approach our Father God in heaven and see his kingdom come on earth. You see, I can bring to God all the riches I've got. Or if I were a multi-billionaire, I can carry all of that stuff, but that does not bring me into the presence of God. My heart before him gives me access to the Lord. Yeah. My surrender to him. The surrender of your life Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is what allows you, as you obediently receive him and give your life to him, it allows you into his presence. It, gives, it, it helps us open that door. Church, none of this is in Kansas anymore. Our Christian life is too big. None of this is a game. I just want to point out the best thing about that film, The Wizard of Oz. The minute she's not in Kansas anymore, everything is, everything is in color. Everything is in color. And yet she longs to go back to black and white. Isn't it amazing how we long for black and white living? We want the color and the excitement, but the truth is we want the security of the known black and white, the familiar. Church, we are called to live out loud. We are called to live in color. We are called to be bright. Um, I used to love watching the old movies when I was a kid that come on, filmed in Technicolor, and I'm filmed in Mario Vision, and <laughs> all these different kinds of things spread across the scene. I used to look at you and go, that is God's call in our lives. Called to live in God vision. Called to live in God life. It's big. It's 3D. It's 4D. It's in color. It's just it's like the contrast turned right up. That is how we're called to live. Let me show you how this works in the lives of three people. Are you with me for three people? Three, three brief conversations about people. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 18. Uh, if you've got your Bible or your mobile phone or something like that, um, I don't mind if you light up or you turn paper, so long as it's got the Word of God in it and it's a sensible version that, that you can understand, that's great. A uh, sensible version is something preferably written in the last 100 years. Um, Luke chapter 18, verse 18, verse 23. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher. It's the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother. All these things I've kept since I was a boy, the young man said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. 
Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. What Jesus said to him effectively was, follow me because being blessed, walking with me is about your heart and your character and your place with me. It's about your loyalty and your allegiance. Are you loving these things that you've done and these things that you have more than me? Because if you are, they've got to go. Come and follow me. It's a massive thing. And it says when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Actually, I'm going to tell you, I think he was very poor. I think he lost everything. But here's what was happening. He came with his wealth and his possessions and his success and his personal morality. And he simply wanted Jesus to add something to his life. How do I add things to what I've already got? It's interesting because the focus is on what Jesus could do for him, not on who Jesus was to him. So the question is, what can Jesus give me? Is not the question. Who is Jesus to me? Is the question. And so often we get that the wrong way around. So often we look at Jesus. So often we come to church. So often we gather or fail to gather. Because we're asking, what can Jesus do for me? What can he add to me? No, who is Jesus to me? If Jesus is simply somebody that adds things to my life, I can choose to ignore him. I can pick him up and put him down. I can connect with him one day and then drop him the next. I can shift my lifestyle accordingly. Because he's just adding something. No, Jesus is bigger than just adding He is my life. He called Jesus good, but he didn't see who Jesus is. The minute he called Jesus good, he should have understood that he was equating Jesus to being like God. But he couldn't see it. The danger is of seeing Jesus as being good, but not knowing Jesus as being your God. And so often I see that in Christian lives. We love Jesus to be good in our lives, but it's hard to make him God and Lord and king over our lives. Lots of people know about Jesus. They know the commandments. This young man knew. He knew the lifestyle. He knew what to say. He knew what to do. But he didn't know the relationship. It's the greatest danger that we fall out of relationship with Jesus. We fall out of relationship with him. And so we excuse our lives and we hide away. And we can feel religious because we know what to say and we know what to do. But the relationship with Jesus is gone. But our salvation transformation begins when we recognize who Jesus is and give our lives to him. So we are loyal now, Lord, to you and to all all that you believe. And so I'm going to tackle one right now. You know, people that will not gather, people that will not be in Jesus' presence. And I mean in his physical presence with his people. Church, we've got to, you assume that all of the restrictions are going to be lifted. And I know that will bring some worry to some people. I want to walk with people that are worried about that and to encourage you. I'm not talking about the people that worry and want to work out their health, but the people that just won't gather, people who walked away from church. I've got to tell you, that that is in direct disobedience to the call in our lives. We are called to gather in the name of Jesus. So, you know, when people say to me, Paul, but what about all the, but you loved them, you've known them so many years. Yeah, I have, but Jesus has loved them for eternity. And they've chosen to walk away. I have got to spend time and be committed and passionate about the people that are walking with God. Is that hard? Apparently it is. See, we want Jesus to add something to our lives when we're called to be loyal to his life. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, of peace, of joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. The young man's faith was in himself and his finances. I've done all this, he said. What else shall I do? You know, we don't add Jesus to our life to fix it. We give our lives to Jesus to recreate it. And then we never pick up our old lives. I'm going to say that again. We don't add Jesus to our life to fix it. We give our lives to Jesus to recreate it. Adding Jesus on top of life's issues isn't the answer. I've tried it. I know it's not. I'll probably try it again this week. Radical surrendering to him above the issues of life is the answer. You know, I'm going to come to that just as I am. You know, that's just as I am. I come to you. Man alive, that song does my head in. It's true. That's the problem. It's true. Just as I am, I come to you. And it's true. We are received and accepted, but our God is good enough not to leave us there. When my children were born, I received them and loved them. Thank the Lord they're no longer in nappies. 
Because at 30 odd years old, it will be messy. I didn't leave them, I taught them to walk and to talk. We led them, they grew, we encouraged them. Yes. Church, that is what God does with us. Let's not just add the knowledge of Jesus onto our existing lifestyle and change nothing. Let's understand that we are new creations. We are born again. Yes. There's a door opened up for us to change everything. It doesn't mean life is going to be perfect, but it means we're on a journey. Just remember we're called to be disciples. We're not called to be perfect now. We're called to be disciples, learning, growing, discovering, changing. That is the call of the Christian life, to not be static, but to always be in motion. The first question is never, what will I ask Jesus to do in my life, but who will I ask Jesus to be in my life? It's the difference between adding Jesus to our life and just being the center of our life. I have shot you all into silence. Yes, you've worked it out. This isn't one of those cuddly, funny sermons, but it is all in the Bible. So we need to know it. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Luke chapter 1. This is children, sorry, next reading. Luke 19, verse 1. Story of a very short tax collector um, who wanted to see who Jesus was. This guy is so short he can't see over the heads of the crowd. But he's heard about this guy called Jesus and he wants to know about him. So he runs down the street and he climbs up into a tree because he wants to get a better look of Jesus. And he's starting to work out, hey, I need to see who Jesus is. I need to know who Jesus is. I warm to this guy. I love this guy because he's found so much more than the rich young ruler. He shares wealth like the young man did, but he's gone a step further. And let me read to you what it says. A short tax collector. I had that bit. It doesn't quite say a short tax collector. It says, well, a short tax collector ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see. And since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. There's no messing with Jesus, is there? Come to me now. No, let's work this through over the next few weeks, Zacchaeus. No, just, just now. Come now. Respond now. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Not only had he wanted to see Jesus, now he gets to meet Jesus. All the people saw this and began to mutter, ooh, ooh. Well, I know Jesus has come for the lost and the poor and the people who don't like, but we didn't actually mean it. I've, actually, I've had this said to me, well, there are new people in church. It's not the same. I mean, I want new people in the church, but I kind of want to select them. <laughs> Isn't it amazing when God touches a life, people mutter. Wow. And they began to mutter this. He's gone to the guest to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus is talking to bad people. That's the whole point. But they didn't see it. Zacchaeus is talking to bad people. Jesus is talking to bad people. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here, now, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That's great, that, isn't it? I love him. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. I love that story. I love it. I love it that the person that people mutter about is made welcome by Jesus. And not only does, get this, Jesus doesn't say to Zacchaeus, come into my house. He comes into Zacchaeus' house. He changes the household. Because when Jesus came in there, that wouldn't have just touched Zacchaeus. That would have been everybody that worked in that household. Jesus entered that entire household and made a difference. And I love that. I love that. Let's not mutter when people enter the household of God. Let's not mutter when people are brought to Jesus, when their lives begin to change and transform. Let's not mutter if it's a battle along the way. Because Jesus didn't come to, to heal the perfect. He came to the sick. He came to heal us and to restore us and to recreate us. He came to people like you and me. So now let's be wound up when Jesus brings more people like you and me to church. When he, when he puts you in the path of more people like you and me to share the good news of Jesus with. Let's not be selective. Let's just share the good news of Jesus. Because he wants to enter those households and make them his household. But I do want to show you something here that's a little bit naughty of me. Zacchaeus stands up and he says, Lord, Lord. So often our salvation is about being noticed. Big gesture, people are muttering about me. Lord, Lord, today I give away half of what I have. 
And I kind of think, I'm glad he's got saved, but he's wanted his life affirmed. He's wanting his life. If only we would just look at him. You know, we want Jesus to affirm our way of life. So often I want people to say, hey, Paul, you're doing a great job. This is why I stand here and I keep saying, are you with me? Because I just need you to affirm me in what I'm saying. And when you don't, I'm thinking, oh, they're going to mutter when they go home. We want Jesus to affirm our way of life. And so we do things that we think will let people see that our life is affirmed by God. Don't get me wrong, this is a wonderful salvation, Zacchaeus and his household. Uh, and it is a wonderful th- thing that I thank God for. It's a great story of God stepping into somebody's life. It means well, but the focus is on his generosity when the focus should have been upon his salvation. He actually, for a moment, shifts the focus onto the finance. Let me read you Matthew chapter 6, 2 to 4. I posted this in the week. When you do something for someone, don't point it out to others and embarrass those you helped. That isn't help at all. Being caring as long as someone is watching isn't kind. You'll get noticed, but that's not all you'll get. When you help someone out, don't do it uh, to look good or feel good about yourself. Just do good for the good of others and do it quietly and secretly because that is how God helps us every day. Matthew chapter 6. You see... Our focus and our attention must always be on God. And the things that we do, even the good things that we do, are not about looking good ourselves. The things that we do and the good that we do must be about making Christ look good. Even for the saved, so much of living is about being affirmed in who we are when the intention is to change who we are. See, I don't want to be affirmed, or Paul, you're fine just as you are. No, the truth is I'm not. I'm not fine just as I am. I'm on a journey. Encourage me, but encourage me forward. Don't encourage me to stay the same. Encourage one another. Build one another up. In a scriptural phrase, what does that mean? Build, you can't build something and leave it the same. Megan has a thing about Lego. So while she was in, in, in uh, lockdown, isolation, she bought, the other week, she bought herself some Lego to, to build over the week and built it in the day. You see, there's no point in buying Lego and saying, look, I've got Lego. But it's so precious, I'm, I'm, I don't want to change a thing. Because it's all there. All the bits are there. Now, she built it until it became... Do you remember I said the other week, you know, the foundation is solid. All the bits are in this room. The prophets are in this room. The apostles are in this room. The pastors are in this room. The teachers are in this room. The servants are in this room. The givers are in this room. All the things that God, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in this room. All the fruit of the Holy Spirit are in this room. It's just that they're in a box, and if you shake it, it rattles. But God is building it. He is not leaving it the same. All the gift that we need exists in this room. All the call exists in this room. That's why God has brought us together. He will build his church. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. He will build it. God loves me and accepts me as I am. He does. But like it or not, you are a work in progress. And just like Megan completed her Lego, her Lego Yoda, (laughs) Grogu, (laughs) you too will be completed. A big part of that progress is the gathering and the building of his people. We don't observe community. We are intended to be in community. We don't stand outside and watch it. Community is involved with it. Jesus builds his church, and that means being in it so it can function and so you can function. You see, we're a bit iggledy piggledy and creaky and leany because not all the parts are there and not all the parts are in the right place. Not all the parts are being refined and purposed. Some parts are not there yet, so some bits are propped up. But as we gather, as we grow, as people re engage, as people gather as church, as people give their lives to him, their loyalty to him, the church becomes more square, becomes more stable on its foundation. It is able to do more, it's able to represent Christ more. Each day, Day, the blessed parts of our life begin to look like the values and the living lifestyle of Jesus. Each day the fruit of the Spirit is shown and seen more in our lives. It's often my experience that Christians have a deep desire to have Christianity fill and change our culture, but not have Christ fill and change our lives. We want Christian things in our lives, but we don't always want Christ to be Lord. 
Everybody feeling browbeaten yet? <laughs> we are not this lot with me. We're, church, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to preach this way now if that's all right. We're not called to go and make salvation, to bring salvation to people. We're told to go and make disciples and teach them to obey everything Jesus teaches. Take that up with Jesus, will you? Because that's what Jesus says. Go into all the world and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything Jesus teaches. He doesn't say, and show them how to float and feel good in worship and to skip and, and to be pandered to and, and to. Oh. He wants to make disciples. He will build his church. And here's the news, the gates of hell will not prevail. That kind of makes me feel like he's going to throw us against the gates of hell. But get, we're on the offensive. Whoever thought, I've said this so many times because I have to get this into my mind. The gates of hell will not overcome. I used to think as a Christian, like the gates of hell must be charging towards me. There's a problem with that concept. Gates of hell never charge anything. <laughs> We charge the gates of the gates of hell. You've got to kind of imagine some medieval dark day. There's some seeds thing where the gates have been shut and fastened, but they will not prevail against the Lord's people. He will build his church. It will break in and set people free. It will bring freedom and life and transformation, and we get to be part of that. And that's why I love this morning's worship, where it was mentioned and said and we sung about we can, we're feeling good and blessed and we can lift up the name of Jesus and I'm feeling under pressure and struggling and we can lift up the name of Jesus that is so beautiful we're all in that ministry this isn't about my ministry because I'm the church leader by the way this is your everyday life work commissioning your call reminding our whole past church community that we're all in full time ministry regardless of the workplace or even lack of a workplace this is your call in Jesus you matter in Christ. We need to confidently know who we are in Christ. His love is all the affirmation we need to allow us to grow. Galatians 1, chapter 10, bringing this down soon. I am now, try, I am now trying to win the approval of human beings. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or God? Am I trying to please people? If I still, if I'm, was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Church, we're not about pleasing man. We've had a revelation of Jesus, so we want to please him. We want to please Jesus. We seek to please and impress people, or we have a radical revelation of Jesus that puts everything else, including the need to be noticed, into the shade. We don't need to be noticed, but Jesus does. Yeah. Yeah. Let's live a lifestyle that Jesus is noticed. Yeah. So I was watching uh, our live stream today, spotting people's names, I know, coming up there. I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting that you're watching. If you're still watching, ooh, it's interesting that you're watching. Um, I'll be having a conversation with you. I hope they see Jesus yeah. and not a show. You know, to throw off the need to please people is to be set free from judgment and condemnation. You know, it seems to me that most of the judgment and condemnation I get come from people. Most of the judgment and cond condemnation I see comes from me as a person towards others. Because I judge and condemn to allow Christ to lead our lives, his opinion of love, being the only one that matters, is what matters. It says in John 8, 36, if Christ sets us free, we are free indeed. Yeah. We are free from judgment. Yeah. We don't have to please people. We just need to please God. Yeah. We are set free. And when Christ sets us free, we are free indeed. Final person who I've got virtually nothing to say about. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus went from there, he saw an, a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Okay, we've done a rich young man, we've done a rich tax collector, so now we've got Matthew, a rich tax collector. Jesus says to him, follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. That's it. Do you know what I really love? I love this. <laughs> Jesus said to him, he says, he told him, follow me. Didn't give him an option. Follow me. Yeah. So he walked up and said, follow me. Boom. Jesus says to us, follow me. Follow me. Doesn't give us an option. Your option is ignore him 
or follow him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they began to mutter. They're good at muttering. They asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Matthew is like a mixture of the rich young man and Zacchaeus. He's lived the lifestyle, but he's wealthy, he's rich. But Jesus says to him, follow me. Um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew found that, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed. That is where we get a blessing, by being like Christ. I have little to say about Matthew. That part of the story says little of him. There's no fuss. He simply follows. There's no argument. There's no down. There's no face. Oh, but I've got to lose so much. There's none of that. There's no... In that case, Lord, I'm going to give it all away. There's no speech. There is simply humble, obedient following of Christ. No grand gestures. Surrender. And his life opened up to be healed by Jesus. Here's what Matthew does in that moment. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There's some debate as to whether Matthew actually wrote the Gospel of Matthew. (coughs) Certainly the heart of Matthew is in there. But what I see from the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, is that it's all about Christ the King and his kingdom. Because Matthew followed. There There was no downcast face because his wealth would be gone there was no grand gesture and speech to try and add jesus into his life on top of everything else that is simply a part of the kingdom giving his life to the king and living well his whole life begins to be realigned at that moment the gospel of matthew was written at a moment when the old jewish temple had been destroyed so this book was written when all the old things are gone the temple had been destroyed when this book was finally written down The place where people had gathered and tried to find God. The Romans had got really a bit uppity about people, not worshipping their emperor, but trying to worship God. All the tangible securities in life were gone within a few years of this story being told. The rich were no longer rich anymore. The old secure system of the temple was gone, it was shaken. There was no normal and the future was insecure forever. But Matthew was blessed because he'd found Jesus. That was his blessing. He was part of that kingdom. See, the rich young man would have lost everything anyway within a few years. Zacchaeus would have lost everything anyway if he'd not found Jesus. But Matthew knew from day one, I've lost everything without Jesus. And I gain everything with him. There was no normal future. There's a king in his kingdom. It's a blessed life to live for Jesus and to grow more like Jesus and to know that the security of his kingdom is yours today. So I'm going to invite the band back. But I want to tell you, in church, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is real. This is real living and real life. And Jesus says simply to us, follow me. And that's not, oh, that's for young people. That's for healthy people. That's for people with a job. That's for educated people. No, this is just for people. Jesus says, follow me. Because he wants you to live your life for him in the life that you've got. The place that you are, the people that you know. The message that you carry matters to those people around you. Who else can carry your message to the people on your street? Who else can carry this message to people at your place of work who else can carry this message to people in the corner shop who else can carry this message to the people at the job centre who else can carry this message to other people but you this is your life but give that life to Christ because he says follow me and then he promises blessing it's a blessed life to live for Jesus and to grow more like Jesus and to know that the security of his kingdom is yours today this is your everyday life your work commission and call, reminding our Hope House Church community that we are all in full-time ministry, regardless of the workplace or lack of a workplace. You matter because you can make Monday matter when you live it for Jesus. 
So this morning I want to leave you with a, just with this phrase, whether you're at home or in person. Jesus looks directly at you and points directly at you and he says simply, follow me. Follow me. This is not a game. This is not Kansas anymore. This is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of heaven. And the challenge to us is to say yes and to humbly follow him. So Lord, we pray now as a church, as a gathered people, gathered online, gathered in person, that when you say follow, we would get up, we would follow. Lord, we don't want to make it conditional on the things that we want. We don't want to say no because I might lose something. We don't want to just add you to an existing life. We want to live well for you. We want our lives to be hidden in Christ so that to live is Christ, to die is gain. Lord, we are yours. And I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us. As we begin to worship, I pray, Lord, that you would fill our hearts now. You'd be present in this room. You'd be present in homes uh, watching in online. Jesus, that you would be the one that looks to us and says, follow me, and you would give us obedient discipleship hearts that simply follow. Well, because that will change everything. That will change everything and bring blessing to us. Would you bless these people, Lord, today? Would you bless us as your church? Amen.